Hello and welcome to Tapcalf Transmissions, the Star Wars podcast, which is currently down one of its usual co-hosts. I am Corey, as always, but not as always joined by this person who is here instead of the person who's usually here. Justin is away because of his whole moving situation. It's definitely not because of any interpersonal drama between me and him. Like I said, definitely not because of that, Justin. But uh, in his place, he has sent his steadfast assistant, Mr. Zach. How are you doing tonight, Bionic Zach? Well, I don't know how I care, how I feel about uh, being Justin's assistant, but uh, no, uh, I'll, I'll take it. All right, all right. I'm good though. If, I'm mostly okay. Good. It, how would how would you describe your your job? I don't know actually. Like I, I've is never there any really like do, who do you it. work for? Who do you work for? Uh, all right, all right. Valid point. Valid point. All right. So no, 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 Zach. Answer the question. This is that's how the the format works. I, 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 I work questions. for uh, uh, for Mr. Eckhart's ladder. Oh, it, oh. So you you work for Mr. Eckhart's ladder. Uh, would you say would you say like you like assist him with things sometimes? Yeah, yeah. I've I've been known to assist. All right. Well, there it is. But hope you are doing well. Of course, this is this should not be taken to slander on Zach to say that he assists Justin because Justin does need a lot of help. Uh, but. How have you been doing as we go through this Bad Batch season? Uh, I'm liking it more and more as we're going. Uh, I thought it started off first couple episodes. I wasn't like too hooked on it, but I, it's growing on me. I think one of these last two are it might be my favorite Bad Batch episode we've gotten so far. One of these last two, meaning like you're not going to tell two... me which or you just well, have... I, I figure we'll get to that later on. Right. A little bit of Ooh. sizzle. Look at that. Already <laughs> in full podcast mode. I like it. Uh, yeah, so we, I don't think we've ever had you on to talk about Bad Batch before. You and I, of course, did the, the Last Jedi novel that is not The Last Jedi that Heir to the expect. Jedi, and then we did Dark Disciple. Yeah, so, yes. so yeah, the, I guess, uh, that was kind of set up for this season. I guess maybe we'll start there. What were your thoughts on seeing Ventress last week? Given I really you didn't do that novel together. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. I'm I'm glad that they kind of they acknowledged that the events of the novel happened, but they weren't mm-hmm. like super over. They didn't over explain anything for anybody who was unfamiliar with it. It's just kind of like a vague idea that yeah, Ventress is back, and we'll maybe explore it a little bit more as we go on. Yeah, somehow Ventress returned, and we'll. Hopefully, get that entails, or what are 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 you on the potential Ventress show train, or are you still holding so off I, there? I I think I think Ventress is a really interesting supporting character. I don't know about giving Ventress an entire show. However, I like the idea of Ventress eventually showing up in Ahsoka, maybe just because those two characters have so much history. I think it would be. Really cool to see them in this very new dynamic that they would have. Yeah, like pre Dark Disciple, I think I'd agree with you that like Ventress in the Clone Wars, even though I do enjoy her in both iterations of that, she is kind of the 2D villain that is just there to fight someone with a lightsaber. But I think like the kinds of like what was added to her character by Dark Disciple and what would have been those Clone Wars episodes, I think there's enough there that. It's an interesting angle to potentially explain, especially if Omega can be there as well. So Yeah, I, I agree with that. I, I think it's more from an aspect of I I don't want them to Boba Fett Ventress a little too much, where it's mm-hmm. like we eventually get the full standalone Ventress show, but then it's like, well, what other kind of uh, events outside of her character can we bring into this show? Yeah, I think part of that just has to do with not really knowing what you want to do with Boba. Cause like there was almost a feeling with Boba that, I mean, Boba's had so many different characterizations in different places. So I'm not like putting this entirely on book of Boba Fett, but the not really knowing where they want to position him on the hero to villain spectrum while also not acknowledging that he definitely was a villain and like trying to put the, the kind of scum side on the good side of everything uh, where I think they have a better idea of what they're doing with Fennec there. Uh, yeah, but with Boba, it's they're not really acknowledging any change in his character to put him there, so it's harder to do stuff with him. But I think with Ventress, there's like a full embracing of this is who she was, this is what she's coming from, and then any future steps she takes can be easily based on that. Yeah, I agree with that because even with like, I, I feel like if Book of Boba Fett didn't exist or like Boba Fett's return didn't happen yet. 
slotting him into the Bad Batch would have felt very natural and kind of like an antagonist role. Mm-hmm. And I, that every once in a while, I'll think like, oh, maybe maybe Boba will turn up in this episode and just doesn't happen. But I don't know. I'm not yeah, too he's still a little young. Yeah, I just think kids. Yeah, <laughs> that that's very true. But um, I, I guess it, it was it's just kind of a desire to know more about what Boba was up to during this time period, which I thought we were going to cover a little bit more in Book of Boba Fett, but I don't know. Maybe we're just missing that gap. But like, where are they going to get a 3D asset for for Boba Fett? Like, did how are they going to have a Django clone running around in these shows? It, it just couldn't happen. Yeah, there's there's definitely not like early previs. Clone Wars Boba Fett to work off of. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, so what have your, I guess, with uh, 10 episodes in now, is there anything about this season in particular that's been standing out to you? Uh, I, I'm really enjoying, like, the one-off uh, episodes we're getting. I'm, I'm glad we're still getting a lot of those, like, bottle episodes that are just looking at individual characters instead mm-hmm. of, you know, full group adventure, like, serialized, like, First Bat Batch were here, then they're there, then they're there. I- I'm glad we're kind of still going all over to different corners of the galaxy at this period of time. Yeah, I, I think it's been also really nice that they're they're kind of willing to have some of the slower episodes too, like this first one last night and the the first episode of the season, where they don't rely so much on the action and they kind of just let things breathe in a very, uh, I called it uh unsettlingly cozy kind of way that yeah. that was just kind of my feeling about identity crisis and even the first episode of the season but doing that with characters like emery and the captured kids are it's, it, it takes a lot of guts to just not show the main characters of the show for a whole episode like that while also not having much action yeah yeah that's very true well i guess you kind of get a free pass a little bit with the with it being an ensemble show too mm-hmm. whereas like I, well, this wasn't the first episode we haven't had any of the the main cast, is it? The episode ten. Uh, I th- I think like this season, it isn't because like there's the the focus on Rio and right. Well, I guess like Echo is always there when those episodes happen, but I I barely think of Echo as being main cast. Yeah, I don't think I ever really did. Well, because I was thinking of like the Crosshair episode from season yeah. two, but like even, even Crosshair is technically part of the main cast, but wasn't for like that entire period. But I, I'm I'm glad we don't need to rely fully on like that yeah. group of clones. But yeah, episode ten was my is probably my favorite episode of bad batch so far nice. so you're just uh like a big fan of kidnapping those kids or is that <laughs> well i i like so while i was watching it and maybe you got this vibe i was just like man this is going to a really dark place if there's yeah. about to be like a an execution of children in this animated show and then i was like wait this okay is... well okay i didn't i didn't get that i didn't think they were going there <laughs> Well, when when they were, I was like, "Oh, uh, are they about to fire squad up upon this this child, the kid that was going for the door?" Yeah, I was yeah, a little I, afraid of that, but I, I'm. I think even stunning him is like it's pretty. Yeah, pretty it's, dark for a kid. It's very grim, but I I was also thinking like, uh, this is post Anakin's genocide of the Jedi yeah. Temple, so it's not it's not quite as dark in concept but like watching it is it's very sinister it made me feel a little uneasy yeah like it, i think that that just that tone in general is something they've been so good at nailing like even even had the kid not been shot like i i still found the earlier parts of the episode really unsettling we got more of the like the grogu cradles uh so that was neat too yeah. but the yeah just the the whole experimenting on kids thing is not I, I'm going to say something controversial and say I'm not about it. I, I don't approve what the Empire's doing there. So brave. Very brave. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, without Justin here, I have to be I have to be willing to step up and make those calls. Even though we know Justin would be like very on board with what they're doing. No, I, I just thought it was a, a very like interesting episode as far as showing like how dark this, you know, if this 
I, I'm thinking about it in the mindset of if this was 10 years earlier and something in the Clone Wars, this would have shocked people to see on TV. Yeah. But yeah, it, it's something that Rebels and the Clone Wars, like they they didn't really go here with the tone the same way. Like there'd right. be some dark shit that's either implied or happening in the background, but there wasn't the same like lingering on it that you get here with like the just, it, it's just like a depressing mindset that it instills yeah even the the clone commandos are so creepy in this episode mm-hmm. just see, seeing those like the lights on their helmet is just so eerie and in i i think bad batch has a bit of a lighting problem where it's it, it's a little too dark in some places but when those clone commandos show up and it's all you see it's terrifying and i really want them to do something cool with the last couple episodes in that yeah, I do still hope that we get a bit more focus from the like the clone advocates on what exactly the position of the clone commandos is in all this, or whether they are just kind of being used at the show or used by the show as uh, kind of the the evil guys to eventually have the gun down with no examination of that relationship. Because it is a, it is a show that is so about the clones and. Uh, in this episode, actually, there was the beginning of addressing something that I'd kind of just default thought was the case for a while, uh, but we hadn't really apparently heard about in the show, where my my impression was always that Emery was a clone and that the scientists at the at Mount Tantus were clones because otherwise they were just being kind of lazy with the models they were making for all the techs. Right. But, uh, we got, I think, the first actual in-show acknowledgement that there was some relationship between Emery and Nalase or and other clones here, uh, other than, or like, she says it to Omega at the start, but that there there might have been more going on in Mount Tantus with the other clones when uh, they're talking about how, uh, like, Emery was a clone, was a was a kid as well. Are they going to be tossed aside? Right. So are you? Do you think the other ones are clones as well, or is that still just me? I think it's a possibility, just because it is this whole, uh, like, I, I, based on the overall theming of the Bad Batch and how often they, you know, it's a clone story, like you said. Yeah. It would make sense if, you know, maybe there's some kind of assault on Mount Tantus in the last couple of episodes, and there is this full realization that's like, oh, well, we're just always going to be used by the empire as long as they're still standing and there are still clones to to use and abuse like this Mm -hmm. like within that theme i think the idea that these secret projects are being like they need people to work on these things and it has to be people that no one's going to care about that they're missing where they're doing these abductions of the kids that's making at least a bit of a stir because we see like the reporting of them earlier on uh, we hear Hemlock talking about how there's not many adults left that have those kinds of powers because Palpatine's kind of already killed them all within the Jedi. And, like, who better to disappear than these people who functionally have no actual family? Well, I thought that would... So there are certain aspects of this episode, and it's one of them early on is, like, when they realize that the child is Force-sensitive. Yeah. And it, it is a very, like, I, I don't think we've really ever really touched on what the general population thinks about the Jedi at this point in time mm-hmm. and, you know, what, what their mindset would be towards it, aside from what they've been told, which, which is just that they're they're traitors to the, the old Republic. And I, I really enjoy, like, looking at that aspect of it where it's just, you're, you know, the one neighbor was so willing to call the empire right away yeah. to collect that child well i think it also it it's kind of like a, a helpful tie into something that seems weird in the original trilogy if you watch it now with all the context we have from the prequels where han just like doesn't believe in the force basically right or just thinks it's superstition and which is like it, it, part of it is just that it's like they didn't know what the world building would look like. How long have the Jedi been gone? How rare were the Jedi? And there's definitely an element of most of the galaxy doesn't interact with Jedi on a daily basis. But I think the approach they're taking now is more the Emperor's attack on the Jedi was like there's the institutional element of it, but there's also the cultural element of it where this whole generation of people who could actually understand 
what the force was has either been entirely wiped out or forced underground, which is the same effect to the point that like, it, it's not a thing people talk about. So if you're Luke or Han's age, you're growing up with maybe a few whispered stories of the Jedi from people who are just like, just barely not afraid of the empire enough. Uh, but there it's just, it's just a mythos that no one has any experience with anymore. Right. And, and it does seem like at this point, the only people who really do have that experience and knowledge are the clones at some level, like even them, like not really knowing what an M count is, yeah. was very like, oh, well, that's an interesting lore detail that you're not automatically associating M count with midichlorian and Jedi. So it, it, it well, that's also some nerd shit in universe. So it's, it's not like they, yeah. Know. But you, you know, as far as like the clones are, like they were working very closely with the Jedi. So. You know, it's interesting to kind of get their worldview and how much knowledge mm -hmm. they had on it, even working so closely with them. Well, I think even from that, it is interesting that Ventress does the test she does for testing Omega. I think from there's the other perspective of like leaving that episode without a definitive answer for Omega having a high M count or not is better just for the story. But you have Ventress now on the side of people who was doing the kind of uh, vaguer, more mystical element of the Force versus the Empire and their hired bounty counter bounty hunters doing the the testing, the experimenting on the kids, where it's basically treated like this racial science that they're doing that uh, is really not epic. Even then, like when they were uh, playing the the hollow game with the blocks, I was wondering like how much that involved in the testing of whether or not they like their force force sensitivity, or if that was more of a way to keep them comfortable while they were there, mm -hmm. because they they really didn't seem that interested with keeping them comfortable. So I thought that was an interesting little detail. Well, with giving kind of. Uh the stranger things like the the facility that elevens trained in right i was getting a lot of those vibes from it i don't remember how many toys were in that but i think there were some but you got you you do have to stimulate these things otherwise how is palpatine gonna s his transfer into someone someday that's it's just like he, he's hunting yeah. for the high iq kids to transfer his mind like this is <laughs> he really wants to be big brand good job yeah <laughs> <laughs> No, but it, it was definitely one of my favorite because it wasn't like it, it wasn't an exploration of a character we don't really interact with too much. And yeah. I I think I enjoy this character a lot more now than just like vague Omega connections. Yeah. But even with that, like it's it is still kind of shown through the impact that she did have on Omega, uh, which I think is important given the context of the prior episode and like showing Omega's ability to connect with people like this. Yeah. But the, the, the biggest part of that was really Emery taking Omega's doll, keeping it and then giving it to, uh, to the new kid. But it, it does add the context of why Emery would have been so open to that in the first place. It wasn't just because of Omega's like empathy superpower. It's because there's something in Omega that is relatable for Emery. Right. And I, I really I'm glad that they touched on the fact that she kept that doll. Like, I, yeah. I I really liked that aspect of it. And I'm wondering. So do you think they are going to destroy Mount Tantus by the end of the season? I think it's possible because like so we see Hemlock looking at the the necromancer or not the necromancers, the uh, the dark troopers working on the CX stuff. We know it's Project Necromancer. And we know that like this research hasn't gotten to where it needs to be by the time that Gideon's doing it in 20 years. So things don't look good for Hemlock or for Mount Tantus. Uh, I, like, I don't think it's a destruction of the program, but I think like it's bad enough that it really sets them behind. Maybe not a full destruction. But something Omega's making a mess on her way out. <laughs> right. So so one of my one of the things I was wondering was like Grogu's involvement in this. When does Grogu come into the picture? Is is he completely missing the entire time the Empire is in power and 
you know, he's hidden until the Mandalorian? Or did they have him at one point in time? Were they doing experiments in the 20 years between Mm -hmm. uh, Order 66 and the destruction of the Death Star? Well, the client knew about him beforehand. It wasn't just like a vague, find some for sensitives and you'll get your reward. It was specifically uh, Werner Herzog was looking for Grogu. So I feel like he does get separated from Kellerin at some point, and maybe does end up as like a, a Mount Tantis kid, a latchkey Mount Tantis kid for a while. But we well, we already do know that he that this project has moved before, though. Right. Just from episode two. So I think that is enough to show that if something does happen with Mount Tantis here, it doesn't mean it's the end. They probably have another backup facility. That's very true. I, I, I guess I didn't. I, I think you more. I was more latched on to the idea that it wouldn't be fully destroyed because it, it, Mount Tantis is like such a monumental location for yeah. Star Wars that they wouldn't just like throw it away so soon. But well, so I think there's it doesn't need so it doesn't need to be destroyed for it to be gone. It just has to be compromised, right? Because the they can move a lot of the project away, but then there still could be something where uh, they like maybe in one of the Filoni like later Mando era movies, they're able to come back and explore some of that with characters who are more involved in that storyline. Because uh, in lead like in the Legends version of it in the Thrawn trilogy, when they when Thrawn is using Mount Tantis, it hasn't been an active imperial facility for a long time it was just the storehouse so i think it could still play into future stories even if they have to abandon it for the purposes of project necromancer right now okay yeah that's a good point i wasn't really thinking about it in terms like that but yeah that i could see them doing something similar to that i just you know i'm trying to think of how they are going to end this show like with like as far as the Bad Batch goes, is there going to be Grand Sacrifice? Will Tech reappear? Will the Bad Batch fly off into the sun? Well, that would definitely kill them all, so they probably shouldn't do that. But I mean, do you have do you have any any ideas on where you think like Omega and the Bad Batch will end up? Any like if you had to pick one to die? <laughs> well, I, I, if I had to pick one to die, I'd say it, Wrecker probably, just because I'm thinking logically as far as like Wrecker's relationship with Omega being so strong. Mm-hmm. I think that would probably have the most impact. But uh, I could see Hunter dying very easily. Also, yeah, I feel like Hunter. I feel like narratively, Hunter is the one to die. But if you're trying to think of like who's the hardest to write a story about later, or to have show up somewhere else. I feel like Wrecker would be the most jarring animated to live action transition possible. <laughs> well, they they'd have to. Uh, I, I'm blank. To, they'd have to get Tamara Morrison to play them all. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that would he just really look, have to like bulk up. It's like uh, it would Flutter. be like Austin Powers. <laughs> <laughs> just a Star Wars version of like Tyler Perry movies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just I, I could see them keeping alive uh, Wrecker and Echo specifically to uh, differentiate in live action. Like, pick the two <laughs> weirdest looking characters. <laughs> We've got Ek in chat saying, I could play Wrecker, I just have to stop working out for a few months. I assume that is that is actually Justin. It's either Justin or Brandon. It's not an account that Charlie can log into. <laughs> but I... So actually, we kind of touched on this already, but I didn't get your I haven't gotten your thoughts on this yet of whether you think Omega is going to turn out to have some level of like a high M count or separate question, technically, the ability to use the force. Uh, This this is tricky because what we know right now is that her M count is transferable and that's why she's valuable to the Empire, right? So I'll read the quote from... Hemlock. Uh, As you know, M-Count cannot be directly replicated from the source. However, Nalise knew of another way, which is why she aided in Omega's escape. The young clone's blood is the only binder that's proven to be compatible with their DNA to recreate their M-Count levels. So, 
I, I, I'm going to assume that she doesn't have an extraordinarily high M count level. I, I, and she's kind of like the O negative of uh, midichlorian counts. Where it's like, yeah, you can use it interchangeably. And she can access the force. Like, she, she does have some kind of sensitivity. But I don't think it's like extremely high like yoda anakin levels yeah. of midichlorians yeah like like my thing was just the uh the test the ventures was doing were so specific the last one especially was so specifically tailored to things we know about omega that i don't think that's meaningless but i i, I the grammar like grammatically the the thing that hemlock said is still a little confusing to me of what exactly some of the some of the articles are referring to where like, it, it, it could be so it could be a thing where it's just there's something about omega's blood that could be used as a binder to connect m count blood with a clone blood or it could be like nala say figured this out and that's how you're able to put m count into a clone and we know because she put like she replicated Django's m count in uh, in Omega, and that's how they also would know that works. So, it like I think there's still a few possibilities on what it actually could technically mean, but we also don't know what the limits on Hemlock's knowledge are on what the mechanisms on this are. So, it, as far as your your question about um, Omega's force sensitivity, I think I, I think Ventress was being very coy and uh, purposely misleading. The Bad Batch into thinking she's not force sensitive, specifically because she has some kind of new, new form of empathy for other force sensitive um, children, and you know because yeah. she was really taken advantage of yeah. by Count Dooku, so she probably doesn't want to replicate that. Also, put a bigger target on them, but she was definitely trying to to mislead them. I, I, yeah. I'll I'll say that. Yeah, I mean, the as we know from Ahsoka, it doesn't necessarily matter for her to have the highest M count in the world. But it's the same thing where the Empire is focusing on the wrong thing, probably. But that, I mean, like all that matters to Palpatine is being able to immediately level up his fourth lightning ranks. So it may, maybe if he just did stuff a bit slower with his new bodies, he wouldn't be degenerating them. What I'm wondering is, um, as far as as far as Omega's, I'm count like acting as a binder. I wonder if maybe there's some kind of dyad between her and Palpatine in some way. Maybe they'll they'll work on that a little bit. As far as exploring know. it, I feel like that would be Palpatine's like best case scenario. But I feel like that's not where it would be going just because I, it, it doesn't work out for him. Yeah. I just, I, I think it's the one piece of the rise of Skywalker that they, they really explore the least is that whole aspect. And I would like dyads to see, or dyads. Okay. Yeah. And I, I think it would be really interesting if what made it possible for him to return and become more powerful in the rise of Skywalker is also like inevitably his downfall. So are you calling Omega a Horcrux? Then? <laughs> I, I guess I am. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I don't know. But we'll see. Uh, I mean, it, so we've got. I guess we've talked a, a lot about the the first episode, but not so much about the second. Uh, where like, I think we got through most of the most of the things the first episode is setting up. But in the second episode, are you going to say something? No, I, I was just agreeing with you. Yep. We, okay. we covered everything that I could think of from that episode. But there is one thing at the end of the second episode that I think we could tie it back to. All right. Do you want to just jump straight into that? So episode two, we've got uh, we're back with the Bad Batch on Pabu. Uh, Fee is tracked. Well, not really tracked back. Uh, X1 is able to go in and download her her travel log and find pabu and that's how we end up in the situation where pabu is under attack 
which I think yeah. everyone kind of saw coming. But, yeah. Uh, <laughs> at the end, Omega does what I said was probably going to happen at the start of the season. So this is the one thing I've ever been correct about in predictions. Omega's going back on sort of her own terms to be able to infiltrate the facility, even though there's more of an arrest here. But uh, yeah, go ahead. I, I definitely didn't like this episode as much just because like it, it was a predictable moment where it's like yeah um, yeah she was gonna go back no matter what yeah uh i'm glad that there's a couple episodes left in the season to kind of explore a little bit more that it's not just like two episodes before the finale and we know the last two episodes are just gonna be like a big assault on mount tantus Mm -hmm. so there is a bit more time to do something some more interesting one-off episodes um, but I really like the way the episode ended where she's arrested on that ship flying back to Mount Tantus and we see she like what looked like was about to start meditating and using some of those practices that she she learned from Ventress in that one episode mm -hmm. to try and tap into the force a little bit. Or she just wants to clear her head a little bit. You got a or, long journey back. Yeah. Well, uh, like we bring her steam didn't... deck. Even there, we, we kind of touch on, like, her her uh, connection with meditation mm -hmm. uh, when she was teaching Crosshair about yeah. everything she learned. And I, I like that aspect of it, where maybe, you know, Omega doesn't have to be a full-on Jedi. She could just be somebody very in tune with the Force. Well, there is also something that didn't... that came up in the Ventress episode where... Uh, it looked like Omega was failing a lot of that meditation stuff, but whenever Ventress was distracted, Omega was more on it. Where, like in the cave, especially when she's she's just about to get centered, and then Ventress looks away. There's the kerfuffle about her identity being found out, and so I, I think there there was still a bit more to that as well. Uh, whether that ends up meaning anything as far as an M count versus just being someone who's more in sync with stuff, yeah, is still doesn't have to go one direction or the other yeah uh, and you know i wouldn't mind if they they did go full jedi for omega i i mm -hmm. think that would be an interesting turn for the character especially you know we have a clone of jango fett that's a that's a jedi and i think that's a really cool idea but there's literally millions of them it had to happen <laughs> it, it was inevitable yeah yeah but um and I don't know. I, I really like the idea of just a very spirit like um like the uh, uh the wills from uh Rogue One. Just very I'm I I think I fucked up the name, but the well yeah, the what uh cheer it was Yeah. The the force or not force order, but yeah. I, I can't I remember mean. what I, I feel like I'm like close with the name, but I could be wrong. Well, the wills were the like the whole George Lucas thing. They were yeah. the guardians of the wills. Yeah, but I, I'd like that the idea of like more characters like that who mm -hmm. believe in the Force can tap into it on some level, but aren't like fully trained Jedi. Yeah, kind of reflection uh, that the Force does exist throughout the universe. It's not just the the superpowers of the Jedi that exist. Exactly, I, and I think that would be oh, cool yeah. to see even brought in with um the new Jedi Order Ray movie that we're getting at some point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, on that note, kind of, do you think that uh, we'll see Omega part ways with the Bad Batch again after escaping Tantus? Like, are we leaving the show with her? in hunter's custody or no well i i think my my big assumption is that all of the bad batch are going to uh sacrifice themselves by the end of the season i don't think anybody's making it out so you think I, like not only is it going to be a cheer it situation for omega it's a cassian and Jin situation for and the rest of the the team well i i, or... I think omega has a good chance of surviving but the the rest of the Bad Batch, I don't think they're gonna have to get Echo into involved in the assault in some way. So he has something to do in this show. So like Gregor, Wolf, and uh, and Echo or and Rex are the only ones who survive on this, and that's when they go off to be in their ATTE in the desert. 
well, I think there needs to be something more that happens there, but there's a reason the Bad Batch hasn't shown up afterwards, or we haven't seen seen them in any kind of, like, Rebels material. Well, I feel like they could disperse into other areas, and that's that can happen without them having to die or get involved with characters that we're familiar with yet. Like the, the Rebellion's a big place, so they could even still be involved in the Rebellion to some level without it having to be like that. Like, it takes forever for Rex to get involved in that fight again, and they've made it clear how untrusting they are of... Uh, Organization I mean, the Jedi, but <laughs> yeah, I, I I guess you're right. They could go off in their own corners of the galaxy. I just with the show being titled The Bad Batch, being limited to three seasons, I, I'm under the assumption this is going to tell a very like conclusive story about the Bad Batch. My take was that like the the kind of success case for the Bad Batch was going to be them like telling the story that they're telling with the clones right now. And then that's kind of their fight. Like they've been in the clone wars for their whole adult lives. And they're only like, they're only 10 years old basically. Yeah. Uh, and then like, once they're done with this, uh, with this fight, uh, then they, they can move out and they can be on their own somewhere else. And they don't necessarily like, they're going to be like Rex is so old by then. Hunter, Wrecker, and Crosshair are going to be old by then. Maybe they have some other side adventures in the meantime. But, like, I think if Omega just goes off because there's somewhere safer she can be, then, like, their primary job is done. Yeah, I'm thinking somewhere safer she could be, or even, like, if she goes off with Ventress and the two of them go train somewhere and reappear in another in another series or movie somewhere. Yeah. I I think like Ventress and Omega teaming up is like my my high probability bet for uh, for after the season. But the the like Pelta style fighter that's kind of a mix of that and the and the 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 Sith interceptor thing that Maul has. I think that is pretty cool. Yeah, I like that. But at, overall, I just I felt like the episode was a little samey. I was like, okay, they're gonna do another Omega gets captured and. Bad Batch are going to fall apart a little bit and then they're going to have to get everything together and go find her again. And I, I'm just kind of... We, we keep doing this. like it. it yeah. It, it's but like it, the Dark Disciple. Somebody gets kidnapped. They have to yeah. fix them. But yeah, it's... it's Even the thing. element of Omega makes the choice to go in order to protect people, like that is how season two ended. Yeah. When she does that. But... I think there's really... a bit more agency to this one, but it's still mm-hmm. it is a, a fairly similar. Yeah, it feels plot. it feels like we're starting right from the the end of season two again at this point. I mean, we have Crosshair back. That's something we have Batcher, but I don't know. Well, it, Omega it, just has to keep doing like one escape with one clone each time. Go back and then like pair just, up with someone. Just new. keep recruiting them. <laughs> yeah, like this time it'll be Emery. So while she's like, well, Emery is her new crosshair. She has to find a new Emery somewhere else. Then that just like cycles through where she. They have what four four more episodes to do a few more escapes. I thought you were gonna say <laughs> four recaptures. more of the lurker hound or lurka hounds from Batchers. But <laughs> once you have no more Batchers, then you can't do it anymore. So I'm I'm just looking at the episode titles for what we have to come. And yeah, based on these, I'd say maybe we don't even see Omega until the final episode again, because the other ones have very like Bad Batch centered names, I want to say uh, Juggernaut into the breach and Flash Strike. And then the final one is the cavalry has arrived. I feel like it'll be we'll probably only get like five minutes of Omega per episode, but I think she'll be there. Like, we, we know what the Juggernaut one is, because that is the, the Juggernaut from the trailer. That mm-hmm. is, like, one of the episodes we get the most footage from, which now explains why Omega was not visible in any of those, even though Crosshair was. Uh, which is why I was thinking that, like, maybe Cross or maybe Omega got captured again on the escape, uh, which turned out to be, like, kind of true, but a little delayed. Uh, but I, it feels like it'll be kind of the Bill Burr episode of The Mandalorian, where they're like breaking into the Imperial facility, getting the data and then scarpering where 
and it's just Omega is now Grogu. And maybe Boba Fett will be involved in that because Fennec was there. But it'll all be very familiar for them. But it, it, it yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> that I like the idea. I, I wouldn't really enjoy if the last three were kind of like the infiltration of Mount Tantus episodes. And then cavalry, the cavalry in the uh, final episode is referring to maybe a larger clone group outside of just the Bad Batch. Yeah. I think there's a lot of potential for what they could do with these last four, though. Yeah, it, I, it feels like the at least one of them might be a longer episode because they've been 16 episode seasons and then 15 episodes now. So maybe Cavalry Has Arrived is a longer Ooh. format episode, too. Yeah, like an hour long. But it, oh, yeah, that would make sense because... I don't know, what do you think of the the release strategy of every couple of weeks you get two episodes? I think that's worked pretty well when they've done it. Like I, I understand the episodes they've done it for, where like I really enjoyed having the Emery episode, but I think it does make sense that it was paired with something that is a bit more like centered on the rest of the Bad Batch. And I think having the whole escape put in one week made sense at the start of the season, plus like the the Rio episodes in both seasons. So I think that made that worked. I thought the the middle two episodes that they released back to back, I, I thought the prior the first episode would have worked better with the previous weeks. Yeah, uh, that was return and infiltration. And, and just because they they were they had a lot more crossover as far as the Cross characters arrow. that were used. Yeah. yeah. Wait, the Believer, like the Bill Burr episode where they're getting the information out of the Imperial base, they hijack a juggernaut for that too, don't they? Yeah. Is it just the same? Is it just an animated <laughs> version of It's just going to be episode? a remake. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because they, they go into the refinery... Then yeah okay and then yeah because that is that is when Grogu's gone because they're going yeah. in to get Grogu's location. I've I've seen this fucking season before. <laughs> well, I I would like. I, I'm really curious with how this is going to end though. Just because I I, yeah. I think there are a lot of different potentials for how they could do it. Mm-hmm. And yeah. I I want to see. I, I want to see kind of the more obvious ending, but I also would like to see something I'm not expecting, I guess. The obvious ending being you think everyone's going to die? The, obvious, the obvious ending obvious being ending? being anybody is going to die. Like, it just anybody out of the main cast. And okay. Omega goes off and does her own adventure. So the, the least obvious ending for you is not only does everyone le- live... Uh, tech comes back from the dead. Yes. They end up like net plus plus one on where they were going into this last batch. I, I'm I'm not gonna if they just bring tech back in one of these last couple of episodes, I'm not gonna enjoy that as much, yeah. I think. Yeah, just I cause... I was on like I mostly for fun, but I, I did think tech would come back. But I I think if anything, Cody being turned into a uh, one of the CX troopers is kind of where a lost brother might be, but that's about it. That would be cool. Well, I just think like there's been so many hints, uh, like the, with the dark troopers, the clone trooper, or the CX troopers. Hemlock has repeatedly been looking at those files and making reference to they're not ready yet. So unless it's just building up for like a dark trooper attack where there's no like personal connection of any kind. But we like we had that, and then we had Crosshair talking about how they were trying to condition them. So if we only ever see the one, and we don't know who any of them are, I feel like it, it's not the most Star Warsy thing to do. I feel like generally Star Wars tries to throw one of those in. Yeah, it just I, I'd I'd like it to uh, to be some kind of big reveal, but also I think I would be okay if it was just random yeah. clones. 
Well, it's like the the Merrick situation where like it was fun to speculate about who it might be, uh, but like I'm not mad about the fact that it was like I never thought it was Star Killer. That was fucking yeah, stupid. That that but... was the most outrageous assumption that anybody made. Yeah. Like the but the idea that it, it might be someone was interesting. And then what I don't get with that is like the dude turned into fucking green green smoke. That's interesting in itself. Like what a letdown. This guy just turned it out to be a, a reanimated corpse. Like, what are you fucking talking about? That's interesting, too. It, it's also, it it sets up the rest of that season so well. We're not, we're not talking about Ahsoka right now, but it, you're right. It's interesting in itself, and it's a great prelude for everything else that's to come later on yeah. in that show. Yeah. But... Maybe Omega is going to come later on in that show too, because uh, we know Omega is a good friend of Harris and Dula because they hung out once when they were like eight. So there, there's so many opportunities for Omega in the future of Star Wars. Yeah, she could show up in Mandalorian and Grogu. Why? Why wouldn't she? You got to just get everyone in there. Yeah, Thrawn, he'll show up. Well, <laughs> uh, but. Uh, anything else you want to touch on from either of these episodes? No, that's pretty much every. I I really enjoyed the the two episodes. First one much more than the second, just because first one was very new. It was we were touching on a lot of things that we haven't really seen before, and second one was just kind of like same old. Like this is a bad batch episode. Yeah, like I, I feel like there's less to, for us to have talked about with the second episode because like I, I think there were important character developments there, but it was kind of what we knew was going to happen. The Pabu attack, Omega goes away, and we're building up for the for the finale. So I think it's necessary stuff. I thought it was executed pretty well. I thought like the atmosphere of the episode was still good, even if it didn't give me the same like creepy feeling of the first one that I, I always enjoy the the melancholy coziness of it all, but. I think it was still a, a perfectly fine episode. Oh, I do really like revisiting the uh, the cave that they were. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I instantly, as soon as I saw that, I was like, oh, that was from the last episode we saw. Like, all but right. My that's... reaction, that was like, why? It, they should know about this cave now. Bad they things should. just happened with it. Is this not a concern for them anymore? Yeah, it's a, it's a very high security risk. Yeah. Fucking. <laughs> Put a door there so you can't fly in without a without a, a pin code or something. Put like a security drone there that can just like yeah. fire at unknown ships like that. Have just... AZ hang out there for a while and see what happens. <laughs> Have a camera. Make Crosshair look over at it once in a while. Seriously, Not anybody can up. sneak up on this island. It, it, it's pretty insane that way. Yeah, the like the the only thing protecting it really is that. Like the assumption that no one would really care what's going on there. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I think that's going to do it for us this week. Next week, hopefully Justin will be back. But thank you, Zach, for for joining me to talk some Bad Batch as we get to the end game here. Yeah, thanks for having me back on. And uh, tomorrow night, so no no X two stream tonight. Obviously, it's Wednesday. Tomorrow night, we'll all maybe be doing something. I don't know. I I thought that we weren't, but I guess we'll see. I mean, I'll be doing something. Oh, okay. Doing, well, so. well, then maybe I'll join you. All right. It'll just be me, you, Arash, and Ilkin. Or maybe not. I don't know. They're going to be busy. Maybe Charlie shows up. I don't know. Maybe Justin gets FOMO and joins. That happens sometimes. But uh, you guys are thanks drinking for watching without me? <laughs> yeah. Maybe I've been underestimating the amount of FOMO that Justin would feel about things. He does tend to say he's not going to show up to something, but then when everyone else is together, he does end up joining. So... I don't know. I might have to re-examine this. <laughs> Open it up for, at a later date. New case right. file. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks for watching, everyone. See you next time.